Hi, so in this video we're going to be looking at the research and development sector of the economy in our Roma R&D model. Now this was probably part four of this little series, so check out the first few parts to look at the other sectors of the economy so that this video will make a bit more sense. But if we're thinking about the R&D sector, what we are thinking about here is we're thinking about ideas being created by researchers or scientists or research, researchers and developers and they're going to be creating ideas and this stock of ideas is going to be given by our parameter A and we've thought of this before as being technology or total factor productivity but our stock of ideas here is A and if we examine A dot we're going to be thinking about the growth rates in A over time and so an increased growth in A is going to be an increase in ideas and by consequence of this it's going to be an increase in patents generated because we're going to assume that our ideas are going to be patented and so a researcher who discovers an idea then has some sort of monopoly right over this idea which it can then sell on and in this model the researchers sell their patents to firms in the intermediate goods sector which we looked at in the last video and this then gives that intermediate goods firm the monopoly right to produce that intermediate good and then sell that on further to the final goods sector making some profit so in this video we're going to think about how these patents are actually generated in the r d sector and these patents we're going to assume just last forever because it will be a lot simpler than thinking of when patents expire and what happens then. So we are going to make some assumptions about the growth rate of the patents or the growth rate in A. And so this is going to depend on the number of scientists or researchers working in the industry. And this is given by LA. We saw LY, the number of people working in the final goods sector. And here we're going to have LA as the number of people working in the R&D sector, LA. And this is multiplied by this parameter, delta bar. And what we'll see in this line below is that this delta bar, we can actually define it to be equal to B, some parameter, multiplied by the um, number of scientists in the industry, again, LA, to the power of some parameter, and then multiplied by the actual stock of ideas, A, to the power of phi phi another parameter and why i've written them separately is because this first equation is going to be what individual scientists are going to take as the evolution of a and they actually have no control at an individual level over this parameter delta bar because they are just a single scientist in a big sector so they don't individually have the power to alter this parameter Whereas at an aggregate level, we're going to have that this parameter is a variable. And so the aggregate change in A is going to be given by this A dot here, which is B LA to the power of lambda multiplied by A to the power of phi. And we're going to make some assumptions that we have lambda is between zero and one and that phi is between zero and one as well. And why, why do we make this assumption that individual scientists cannot have an impact on this parameter? Well, it's for a similar reason that we had in the learning by doing models that we had constant returns to scale to an individual firm and increasing returns to scale at the aggregate level because this allows us to have a balanced growth path in the aggregate while having a reasonable individual level optimization problem because if individual firms had increasing returns to scale, then they might be tempted to just keep keep upscaling their production and we just have very explosive growth and no real balanced growth path equilibrium. So we have to have these sort of different individual and aggregate level technological accumulation. So what this accumulation equation will depend on quite a bit is the level of phi that we choose and the the intuitive way to think of this phi uh, is the fact that it enters into our 
accumulation of ideas in as the power of the existing stock of ideas A. So we're looking at how this stock of ideas changes over time, but this depends on how many ideas we currently have. So if we're a very advanced civilization, we're going to have a very high stock of ideas, whereas if we're a very primitive civilization and we don't really have any technological advancements, then this A is going to be near to zero. And how, how this stock of ideas affects how our ideas grow actually affects us quite a lot. So if, for example, we have this phi as really large, we, we have a phi maybe of 50, well, as we increase our stock of ideas, our change in ideas is going to be very high. So as we as we discover more ideas, these ideas are going to help with discovery discovery of more and more ideas. So our our capital stock or our, our stock of ideas is going to grow very quickly and keep doing that. Whereas if this phi is say less than zero, this says that as we increase our capital stock, the growth rate of ideas that we find is going to decrease. And this might be because we found all the easy ideas first, uh, we've invented the wheel and what have you, and from then on it's very difficult to come up with new ideas. We have to start thinking outside the box and coming up with things like electricity and space travel and whatever. So we can discuss a few cases of what we might choose phi to be in this model and one of the key ones in the literature is setting this phi equal to 1 and this if we set phi equal to 1 we can think about the growth rate of our a parameter and we do this by just having our a dot divided by a this is just growth rate rules and we'll notice that if we have a to the power of 1 with phi equal to 1 this will just equal to a and we've divided through by a so the a just disappears altogether and we get that our growth rate of a is equal to b l a to the power of lambda and we can we can further write this as b a l to the lambda multiplied by l to the lambda where a l is just the fraction of workers who are in the research and development sector and we we'd have the l a i probably should have mentioned this earlier but so our workers in the R&D sector plus the workers in the final goods sector is equal to our total stock of workers and so if we have some fraction of workers in the R&D sector then this is going to be some fraction of our overall workers and then the remaining workers are going to be in our final goods sector and this is going to be equal to L. So we, we can rewrite uh, the number of workers in our R&D sector is just AL multiplied by LR overall labor force. So that, that's what we've done here. And if we wanted to then look at the growth rate of our growth rate of A, and we're looking for a balanced growth path, so where this growth rate of A is constant, well, we, we can take growth rate rules of this equation here. And what we'll quickly notice is that we need to have this GL which we assume to be n, the growth rate of the labor force or of population, it needs to be zero for this for this growth rate of our growth rate to be equal to zero itself as well. So in order to have a balanced growth path in this model with a very specific parameter of phi equal to one, we're going to need no uh, growth in our population, which is not really something that we observe empirically. So we may not want to go down this route um, but but it's a possible route and it's one that's been thought about because theoretically it's quite simple to go through if we just assume that we have no uh, labor supply growth. We could also consider that we have phi greater than one and in this case we don't really have a balanced growth path that, that will naturally come about that we will really want to consider using and the reason for this is that the only balanced growth path that we'd find here is we would need a negative growth rate of our technology stock and this isn't really something that we want to consider we'd need ga less than zero for a balanced growth path we do tend to want to have a balanced growth path this is the criteria we're looking for because we think this is an accurate characterization of a lot of uh, developed economies so 
we're, we're not really going to want to use this example. You can go through the working to find this out yourself, but I'm just going to skip through it because it's not something that I'm going to pursue. Um, but the thing that we will pursue in these videos is we're going to have that our phi is less than 1. And the reason we pursue this one to go through all the working here is that it gives us a nice balanced growth path for some reasonable growth rates of our technology. So we can consider our GA again, and we just divide A dot through by A, and then we get this as our result. We, we haven't made any specific assumption about phi, so we still keep it in phi minus one. And we want a balanced growth path, so we're gonna set the growth rate of our growth rate equal to zero, and see what happens. And by, by working through and using growth rate rules and assuming that our parameters don't grow at all and they're just constant, we, we can get to this equation and then rearrange it to show that on a balanced growth path, we're going to have our growth rate of the technology stock is going to be equal to our parameters here, which is our lambda multiplied by the growth rate of the population M over 1 minus phi. So phi does still factor into our growth rate of A, as we would expect, but we are increasing our growth rate in our population growth rate. And so as, as we have more population, we can increase the number of people that are working in research and development, and so we can increase our productivity this way. But we do still have re diminishing returns to knowledge production, so we have to have this positive population growth in order to increase growth in our technology stock. If this n is equal to zero, then we just have this growth rate of our technology stock is equal to zero as well, and we don't have any growth in our economy. So we're, we're going to assume that we have some positive population growth, as we do tend to see in our economies. And in this model, we do have a balanced growth path with a positive growth rate, which is good that is what we have been looking for. So what we can do now is we can sort of derive what the price of a patent is going to be that is coming out of the R&D sector. So in order to do this, we can think of this as a, a no arbitrage condition or just that our opportunity cost is going to be equal to the benefit of selling a patent or we can think of it as just how much a bidder or someone that is buying the patent is willing to pay. So first we want to look at the opportunity cost of selling a patent. So this is going to be, or even the opportunity cost of buying a patent, this is going to be the interest rate multiplied by the price of that patent PA. And so if the amount that is purchased was instead invested in capital or anything else, we would get this rate of return R. So this is the opportunity cost of owning a patent. And this cost has to be equal to the benefit of owning the patent. And this is why there is no arbitrage in this market. So the benefit of owning a patent is going to be the profits that we can generate from investing in a patent. So we discussed profits in the intermediate goods sector in the previous video. And then we're going to add on the change in price of this patent in the next period. So what we can think of this condition as telling us is imagine that we are just going to buy this patent and hold it for one period. Well, we're going to lose the investment that we have invested multiplied by the interest rate for one period. So just multiply by R, not R squared or R cubed. And then equal to the profit we generate in that one period from owning the patent, plus what we could then sell the patent for in at the end of the period, in the start of period two. And so this is what our price of the patent has to meet this condition. So we can divide through by P8 to get this next line of working. And what we can recall is that our interest rate or our rate of return to capital R is going to be equal to the marginal product of capital. And so we could we could do this derivative of the production function and find something like, like this condition that I've just written down that our R is equal to alpha squared and it's just a derivative of the production function. 
And what we can see is that this is equal to just some constant proportion of our um, output divided by capital, a constant proportion of y over k. And so r has to be constant. And this is what I put here. And r being constant does then necessarily imply that our profits over pa is also going to be constant. So what we can then do with that is we can recall that our profit function that we derived from the previous video in the intermediate goods sector, we had that this profit was equal to alpha multiplied by one minus alpha multiplied by y over a. And we can see that this grows at a growth rate of n, or it's equal to the population growth rate. And so what this implies is that our pa dot over pa also grows at n because what we what we have to have here is that if r is constant then this this side or this right hand side of the equation has to also be constant so if if we have our profits growing at rate n we then need to have our p dot a or our pa growth rate which this is growth rate of pa is equal to pa dot over pa which is then equal to n for all these equations to make any sense and so from this pa dot over pa equaling n we can then substitute that in to this equation up here and substitute in for n here and then we have that r equals pi over pa plus n we can then subtract n from both sides and then we can get to, with a bit of rearranging, we can get to this condition here and this is our price of a patent PA and it says that the price of the patent is equal to the profit in each period divided by the interest rate or the return to capital rate minus the population growth rate N. So this this is what we can use the R&D sector to find. We can use it to find the price that we are willing to sell and we're willing to buy patents for, and this is the price of a patent. So that's the basics of the R&D sector. In the next video, as you can see on the bottom of the screen, we're going to start thinking about the labor market and the goods market and just coming up with some aggregate outcomes in this economy. So check out the playlist for that. Make sure to leave a like on this video if it was at all useful and do subscribe to gain some economics into your subscription feed.